Welcome back to the Iran Policy Podcast. Today's guest is Strawn Stevenson, former member of the European Parliament, president of the European Parliament's delegation for relations with Iraq, and president of the Friends of Free Iran Intergroup. Mr. Stevenson is the author of the recently published book, Dictatorship and Revolution, Iran, A Contemporary History. In this episode, we'll delve into the importance of discussing Iran's modern history, the role of the Pahlavi dictatorship, the hijacking of the 1979 revolution of, by the mullahs, and the democratic alternative to the current regime. Welcome, Mr. Stevenson. Thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Stevenson, you recently wrote a book um, called, uh, it's titled Dictatorship and Revolution, where you assess some of the key political and historical turning points in Iran's modern history. Why is it important to have this discussion about Iran now? Yeah, I published this book because I've been very interested, of course, in the ongoing revolution which is happening in Iran right now. And the focus of this revolution is totally different. In the past, we have witnessed nationwide uprisings because the people in Iran, it's like a powder keg. They're ready to explode. But previous uprisings were because of economic issues, the price of eggs going up, the price of fuel being increased by the regime. This time, after the horrible death of Masa Amini uh, back in September last year, because she apparently was not wearing her veil properly uh, and she died in police custody, that sparked an uprising that has grown in ferocity. 750 people have been killed by the brutal thuggish IRGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guards, over 30,000 people have been arrested. And you hear the chanting of the people in the streets. They are chanting, down with Khamenei, down with Raisi. They want an end to this regime. The focus on this uh, uprising and this uh, revolution, the focus is regime change. And that is where things have taken a different uh, turn. And that encouraged me to uh, start looking at the background to uh, what has happened in Iran and, and to write this book, which was published uh, earlier this year. Really, uh, Iran has suffered over the past 120 years repeated dictatorships. They started with the uh, despotic dictatorship of the Shah, uh, and then moved on to the fascist uh, theocracy of the Mullahs. And only one tiny little window of opportunity appeared during all of that 120 years uh, where they searched for desperately for democracy. The one tiny little uh, opportunity that arose was with Mossadegh, and, you know, my research uncovered some very interesting facts. Going back to the Qajar uh, dynasty, which, of course, was overthrown by uh, Riza Khan, the father of the Shah. Riza Khan was a Cossack uh, mercenary. He wasn't able to earn enough as a soldier uh, in the Persian army. So he enlisted as a mercenary with the Russians, with the Tsar's Cossacks. And he gradually rose through the ranks uh, from sergeant to an officer, ending up as a brigadier general, despite the fact that he was an illiterate thug. He was a, a brutal uh, bully. Indeed, his son, the Shah, in his own memoirs, described his father as one of the most frightening people he had ever encountered. So this illiterate thug working as a Cossack mercenary for the Russians, uh, he helped 
with the aid of the British, to overthrow the Qajar dynasty uh, and then became himself uh, eventually the Minister of War and then the Prime Minister and then ultimately crowned himself as the Shah, beginning the, the, the monarchy, uh, the tradition of the Pahlavis. And of course, when the Second World War was looming, he began to flirt with the idea of being an ally of Hitler, which uh, deeply uh, disturbed the uh, Americans uh, and the British, who helped uh, overthrow uh, Reza Khan and replace him with his son, uh, Mohammed Reza Khan, who became the Shah of Iran. And then we see unfolding the gradual building of uh, the autocracy that came to define the rule of uh, the Shah. The one window of democracy that I mentioned earlier with the advent of Mossadegh, Mossadegh was uh, and, and is still to this day regarded as a hero in uh, contemporary Iranian history. Mossadegh was deeply uh, disturbed by the way companies like British Petroleum, BP, were exploiting the, uh, the, the resources of the people of Iran. And he was calling for the nationalization of the oil resources uh, in the country. And of course, he was deeply popular as such and rose, uh, I think the Shah had no option but to make him prime minister. But then when uh, I was examining and, and researching the background for my book, I discovered that in a deal with BP, the Shah had insisted on 16% of all the oil revenues being paid every year into the Pahlavi Foundation, his own personal family foundation, 16%. I discovered that the British Treasury in London was getting more in tax revenue from BP than the people of Iran were getting uh, from the uh, sale of licenses and the extraction of oil by that company. So Mossadegh was absolutely right in demanding that uh, this exploitation had to stop and he wanted the nationalization of uh, BP and the other oil companies. And of course, the Americans and the British, they said to the Shah, we can't allow this to happen. And the Shah tried to oust uh, Mossadegh, tried to sack him. That caused an uprising. The Shah, uh, being terrified of the uprising, fled from the country. But with the help of the Americans and the British, he was quickly restored to power. Mossadegh was arrested, charged with treason, uh, imprisoned. And when he was released from prison a few years later, spent the rest of his life under house arrest. So that one little window of opportunity to try to bring democracy to the people of Iran was quickly closed down sadly, with the help of the Americans and the British. The Americans and the British, of course, then continued to encourage the Shah to, uh, towards his autocratic uh, leanings. They helped him to uh, create the, the one-party state that uh, he ruled over, getting rid of all the political opposition. The CIA helped him to set up SAVAK, uh, his brutal intelligence and police security service, which tortured and executed not only political prisoners, but, you know, any dissidents, even authors, actors, artists, an incredible, uh, cruel and despotic regime with a, an incredibly cruel uh, police service and, and security service under Savak. So, you know, the, the Shah's reign became increasingly unpopular until in 1979, of course, there was the massive revolution 
and the Shah once again fled the country never to return. The problem was, while uh, the Shah was in power, he had serially imprisoned or executed most of the genuine leaders of the opposition who were seeking democracy, in particular leaders of the MEK, the mujahideen e uh, the only survivor of whom was Masud Rajavi because of an international outcry when he was sentenced to death. So when the Shah fled in 1979, Ayatollah Khomeini, who had been in exile in various countries but had ended up in Paris, he returned and hijacked the revolution because the uh, genuine opposition under the MEK had been in jail, had not had time to uh, formulate their uh, their their uh, support, and uh, Khomeini was able to hijack. The, the revolution, with the people of the West saying, oh, well, this is a spiritual leader. He is not going to be interested in politics. He'll be okay. He'll be a soft touch. We'll be able to manipulate him. The people in the West little realized that Khomeini was actually a, a psychotic uh, murderer. And he proceeded then to uh, execute as many of the uh, MEK, in fact, he wrote into the constitution when he banned Masud Rajavi for standing for election as president because Masud Rajavi had refused to accept the Veliate Faki uh, constitution, the theocratic rule of the the, uh, the mullahs. He'd refused to accept that. He was therefore banned from standing for election. And of course, Khomeini uh, won the election hands down and then proceeded to uh, execute and torture and imprison uh, all of the MEK people that he could find writing into the constitution that to support the MEK uh, was regarded as Mahareb or waging war against God, which carried the mandatory death penalty. And that's why in 1988, in six months of that year, 30,000 political prisoners who were supporters of the MEK mostly were hanged, were executed, based on a fatwa from uh, Ayatollah Khomeini. And full knowledge of this was only released with the audio tape of uh, the Grand Ayatollah Montasari who uh, was lined up to be the uh, the successor to Ayatollah Khomeini. So he was the second most important person in Iran at the time, uh, after the revolution. But in an audio tape released by his son, you could hear him saying in 1988, you cannot simply start executing people, some of whom have already served their sentence, uh, having been charged with being you know, dissidents and supporters of the MEK, and you're bringing them back to prison, sentencing them after a three-minute trial to death, simply because they say they still support the MEK. Even pregnant women are being hanged for this offence. You cannot do this. You will go down in the history of Iran as monsters if you do this. And it was the release of this audio tape by the son of Montasari. Montasari, by the way, after um, making this audio tape, was uh, sentenced to house arrest for the rest of his life and never again released from house arrest. And when his son released this audio tape, he also was charged with, with an offence. And it became a scandal across the whole of Iran. And of course, the United Nations now have started uh, serious investigations into the massacre. We've long known that 30,000 people disappeared and were uh, clearly massacred, but their bodies were hidden and they've concreted over the mass graves to stop their relatives ever been able to 
even find where their loved ones were buried. And it's this huge scandal on a scale unprecedented since perhaps the end of the Second World War that has turned Iran into a pariah state and the theocratic fascist mullahs have become so unpopular now that a revolution is certainly boiling again after uh, the current eight months of uprising with the people chanting no to the, the mullahs and no to the turban, no to the crown. Because mysteriously, after what I was telling you about the rise of the Pahlavi uh, dynasty, mysteriously, the son of the Shah who fled with his father in 1979 and who has been living in some opulence ever since in America and with mansion houses in many places in the world, because allegedly his father fled with billions of dollars. Some people estimate as much as $30 billion from presumably the money that he insisted was paid into the Pahlavi Foundation. But the, uh, the so-called crown prince, uh, Riza uh, Pahlavi, uh, who has been virtually invisible for the past 44 years, suddenly now, perhaps with the smell in his nostrils of an uprising that could get rid of the regime, he has suddenly emerged from obscurity and he is suddenly doing a world tour. This year he has been to the European Parliament where he was completely snubbed, apart from the two MEPs who invited him to attend a meeting in the European Parliament, only one other MEP attended. Then, bizarrely, in March of this year, he was invited to address the Munich Security Conference. Now, that was an utter disgrace. The Munich Security Conference uh, chair decided that it was unwise to invite Vladimir Putin, for obvious reasons, uh, to represent Russia, or Raisi to represent Iran, which was a good decision, but then decided that he should invite Riza Pahlavi as a representative of the Iranian people, which was, you know, an incredibly uh, bizarre thing to, to do. And Riza Pahlavi went to the Munich uh, Security Conference. He tried to organize a small protest outside the hotel where the, the conference was held, but, you know, only about 20 people attended. But one of them was seen carrying a placard with a picture of uh, Parvis Sabeti, who was the brutal, uh, cruel head of Savak, the Shah, the Shah's uh, secret police. I thought uh, Sabeti was long dead, but apparently he's still alive, also living in exile in America. And on this placard, it had stated, a nightmare for future terrorists, almost indicating that the, the so-called crown prince, who was keen to see uh, the monarchy restored in Iran, would reintroduce Savak. And he himself calls the MEK terrorists. So nightmare for future terrorists. He's threatening that he'll bring back Sabeti as the head of Savak to be a threat to the MEK and, and future terrorists. I mean, I think if anyone uh, is advising uh, Riza Pahlavi on public relations, they really, they really should look for a new job because that was the craziest uh, situation I have ever seen. But then it's yeah. perhaps not surprising because Riza Pahlavi in a television interview with uh, Iran uh, International TV, told them that he was in communication with the IRGC and the Basij, because after the overthrow of the Mullahs, he says that we will need the IRGC and the, the Basij to restore law and order. So, 
you know, a guy who regards bringing the IRGC back to uh, Iran after we uh, overthrow the mullahs, it's like saying, you know, I will bring back Heinrich Himmler and the Gestapo uh, to restore order after we get rid of Hitler. It's unbelievable. But this is a measure of this guy. He now is touring around. He went to Israel in April. And, you know, he's playing into the hands of the mullahs because the mullahs have exploited... I'm taking advantage of yeah. Yeah, the mullahs have uh, exploited his appearance in Israel by showing television coverage and saying, you see, we told you that this is what would happen if you get rid of us, if you get rid of the mullahs, you will end up uh, restoring the monarchy uh, who are backed by our arch enemies, the uh, Israelis, the Zionists and the Americans. And of course, this is trying to sow confusion in the heads of mostly the young protesters on the streets in Iran, they are going to say, well, should we be risking our lives going out on the streets to join a protest and perhaps being shot, wounded or killed by the IRGC when all we will achieve is perhaps the restoration of the uh, dictatorship of the monarchy. And that's why Many young people, not so crazy as uh, perhaps Riza Pahlavi thinks or the mullahs think, that's why they have been chanting no to the crown, no to the turban. They have been openly stating, we do not want to restore the monarchy. We do not want another dictatorship. We want a secular democracy. We want a republic. And the people are quite adamant about that. Riza Pahlavi's days are over. There is no future for the monarchy. And he is being used as a useful idiot by the current uh, Mullah's regime. It, may, it makes perfect sense. And uh, I guess this is why uh, we, what makes your book uh, pretty important is I was uh, reading it, what's interesting is the the characteristics, the common characteristics that both the mullahs dictatorship and the Shah dictatorship have in common. So they claim to get their power from from God, and they hold on to power through um, brutal institutions like the Sabak during the Shah um, rule the, during the rule of the Shah, or today we have the IRGC and the MYS. And they, they have so much in common that perhaps like the younger generation or people who have not studied into the history of Iran, they're just going to look at the past four decades of the mullahs. And given all the coverage that some of the media are giving to, uh, to, to Reza Pahlavi, uh, they're going to think they're, they're trying to brand themselves as the arch enemy of the mullahs as the alternative. So how do you see this kind of narrative as helping or hurting the ongoing protests and what the people are trying to achieve on the streets? Well, you know, it was interesting when I was doing research for the book because I had always heard the mullahs had claimed we were central uh, to the revolution to throw out the Shah. We hated the Shah and everything he stood for. And in fact, that proved not at all to be the case. When I was researching this, I discovered, just as, as you said, the Shah actually required the support of the mullahs so that he could claim divinity, so that he could claim he was sitting on the peacock throne uh, as part of God's will. And of course, the mullahs required the support of the Shah for their money, their power, their wealth, and there was this symbiotic relationship between the Shah and the mullahs during all of the time the Shah was, was on the, the throne. So, you know, for anyone now in the theocratic regime to try and claim that they were arch enemies of the Shah is a downright lie. They were working very closely together. And now they're exploiting Riza Pahlavi for the same purpose. They're using him, as I said, as a, a useful idiot 
uh, pretending that he will restore the monarchy if uh, the uprising manages to throw out the, the Mullahs regime. That uh, is not going to work, and the people of Iran are not going to be so easily fooled uh, by that story. Absolutely. And it's interesting that you said that throughout history, when you study uh, the past century, I guess, there's always been this symbiosis between the mullahs and uh, the, the Pahlavi dynasty. So when, uh, when, when the Shah was in power, he took advantage of the mullahs to consolidate his power, to justify his claim to the throne. And right now that the mullahs are in power, they're using the remnants of the Pahlavi dictatorship as a tool to um, associate the, the protests to foreign elements and to um, pave the way for, for conducting more massacres and, and repression of the people. So given all that we've seen in the past century, is a return to the, to the ousted monarchy of the Pahlavi ever going to be a viable path to true democracy in Iran? No, of course not. The people of Iran will never accept that. Uh, the people who are taken to the streets just now, mostly young people, and remember, mostly led by women. Uh, women, life, freedom was the chant uh, throughout this uprising. These are brave, courageous young women who are sick to death of uh, this misogynist regime that has ruined their lives, that has banned them uh, from wearing the clothes that they want, has banned them from attending uh, sports uh, matches, has banned them even from dancing and singing in public. I mean, it's uh, a regime that has reached the end of its tether. And there is no wish for a restoration of the monarchy. The people do not want to go from one dictatorship back to another one that was ousted by their parents in the 1979 uprising. And I think Western powers have to be careful about this. I was in Canada uh, recently uh, talking to politicians in the uh, capital in Ottawa. And there, there is within the parliament uh, an organization called Friends of a Democratic Iran, like the Friends of a Free Iran that I chaired in the European Parliament. And Friends of a Democratic Iran has a great many Canadian supporters in the, the Canadian Parliament. And suddenly, uh, a couple of months ago, an email was circulating saying that there was going to be a free Iran meeting. And of course, many people assumed that this was an email from the Friends of a Democratic Iran. And when they turned up at the meeting, who should appear? but none other than Riza Pahlavi himself. So using subterfuge to come in through the back door to meetings like this, to trick people into uh, hearing his uh, viewpoint. And that caused uh, outrage in the Canadian parliament. People didn't like to be tricked in that way. And Riza Pahlavi has he has really cemented his unpopularity by uh, playing these sort of games. Uh, the West should be aware that this is the kind of tricks that the monarchists are playing. And I would be very surprised if uh, these tricks are not being encouraged uh, absolutely, implicitly, by the uh, IRGC and MOIS. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And, uh, and my final question to you is, uh, so going back to your book, one thing that's interesting is that whenever we had a uh, regime change in Iran or a shift in power that was instigated in a way or, in, or another by a foreign power, whether it was uh, Reza Shah coming to power with the help of rising up the, the echelons of power with the help of the Russians and then the British took over and then they overthrew him and then his, sh his son came over and then there was this um, <clears throat> sort of this conspiracy that paved the way for Khomeini to seize power. So whenever there's this um, plot that's being cooked abroad to create this alternative, it has failed. So 
how, how what are the characteristics of a true democratic alternative that is rooted in the people and in the in the struggles of the people themselves in the the blood that they have shed the price that they have paid what are the characteristics of that alternative to the regime and how can that alternative make sure that freedom and democracy is is established in iran well i continually hear from uh, people in the west who are perhaps ignorant of uh, what's really happening in iran they say oh but the uh, mek has no real presence inside the country they're not popular in the country i'm afraid they're completely wrong the resistance units of the mek have been uh, burgeoning in towns and cities right across the whole of Iran, particularly uh, during the current uprising, and indeed have coordinated the current uprising. And recently, quite astonishingly, uh, remembering that to be a supporter of the MEK in the constitution carries the mandatory death penalty. And yet, uh, three weeks ago, units, resistance units, appeared in several parts of Tehran, and in four other cities, marching and shouting, we are the MEK, bravely confronting the authorities, saying, we are the MEK, we want to overthrow the theocratic regime, we are the future. And under the charismatic and incredible leadership, courageous leadership of Mariam Rajavi, uh, we have, in exile, we have a government in waiting. Mariam Rajavi is the president-elect of the National Council of Resistance of Iran, and as such is offering a 10-point manifesto for freedom, justice, democracy, an end to the death penalty, uh, an end to the nuclear threat. It's a manifesto that I, as a Western politician, would be proud to serve under. I would be proud to stand for election under such a, a manifesto. And she is saying, you know, we are ready. We have the equipment. We have the ability uh, to form an interim government until such time as we can re rewrite the constitution of Iran and give the people within months the freedom to exercise their vote to elect a democratic uh, government to uh, restore democracy and restore peace and justice to Iran. That is what the future holds. And that is why it's so important to get rid of the mullahs. But the uh, overthrow of this regime is in the hands of the Iranian people. There is no wish for another Syria. There is no wish for another Iraq. There is no wish for international or foreign intervention. The people themselves have it within their hands, as they have courageously shown during the, the past eight months, taking to the streets unarmed uh, civilians facing the guns and the batons of the IRGC and the Basij. These courageous people themselves have it within their hands to uh, secure regime change, to secure uh, a new future. Uh, for the people of Iran, for the 85 million people who have been reduced to poverty and despair by 44 years of theocratic dictatorship. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Stevenson. It was a very, uh, it was a great uh, conversation. Thank you for the insights. And again, thanks for the great book. We'll make sure to Put a put a link to it in the description. So if our viewers, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Um, and hopefully we're going to have you back on the program sometime again in the future. Thank you so much.